Um, Cindy Jenkins, one of our committee members from USU Extension Service will facilitate the first session. Cindy, take it away. Hi, good afternoon. All right, I'm excited to be here and for all of you to be watching as well. And I'm going to be introducing our first speaker, April Litchford, who is a colleague of mine. I, so I'm really thrilled to introduce her, I've done some good work with her and she is a wonderful person. And here's her bio. April Litchford is the Home and Community Extension Assistant Professor for Box Elder County, Utah. She's also a registered dietitian nutritionist with expertise in child nutrition, weight loss techniques, and diabetes education. Her extension work focuses on food and nutrition, health and wellness, and resource management programs. All right, take it away, April. Thanks, Cindy. So good to be here with everyone. Um, I'm excited for this presentation and think it's so applicable to our state of, of our society right now. I'm so glad that there are so many that are willing to put time and effort to not only put a conference together, but to come and listen. Um, so you might be wondering what makes me an expert on this kind of a topic. Um, I don't really know if I'm an expert, except that I have been preparing and trying to keep my family and I ready for any kind of a disaster. And recently I have had children that have- April, April, yeah. just a second, I'm sorry. You, can you click on display settings at the, at the top and, and change your, your screen to presenting mode? Oh, yes, Does that work? Perfect, thank you. Okay. Okay, now it's swapped though. My camera's on the wrong side. So if my um, eyes track, that's why I'm not ignoring you, okay? Uh, recently, um, as I was saying, I've had children that have left my home and started to go to college, to university setting. And I've kind of thought about what do we do for them to be prepared uh, while they're in a university setting? Because they, you know, share a, dorm room with six other people. But I thought, you know, they're still at least 35 minutes away from me in good times. What if it was a disaster time and they couldn't get home? How would they have food and, and the basics that they need? So we've done as a family some thinking about how to fit food storage and emergency preparedness into small spaces. And so I want to share with you today what I have learned um, about that. I'm also a registered dietitian nutritionist, so I will put in a little bit of information here and there about nutrition and why it's important that our food storage is not only adequate to provide calories, but also nutritious in scope. So the objectives today is to discuss why and how all households um, should be actively preparing for emergency situations and to identify ways to begin preparing in urban spaces. And I call it urban spaces, but it is generally just spaces where you only have so much floor space, right? And you don't generally have uh, land or outbuildings that you can use to store uh, products in. So we're just talking about floor space within an apartment or a smaller space like that. Um, and there's three steps that work well for us as a family. And I have seen with other experts in the field and that's to condense, to plan and sustain. And we'll talk about that in a little more depth. Um, we'll also review some creative ways to store water, food and other essentials in smaller spaces and how to build a basic food storage plan or at least get it started because that's kind of the point, right? Let's do something. We can sit and talk about it and plan and read but let's do something, let's get it started because something is better than nothing, especially in a disaster setting. Then we'll talk a little bit about the next steps for your emergency preparedness plan. And I just wanna caution you that you'll need a piece of paper or something to write on and something to write with. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, just something, okay? For later on in the presentation. All right. So we often hear this, what would happen if, um, I think it's kind of a fun game for some people to sit and think about and talk it through. Well, what would happen if this happened or what would happen if that happened? And where my family and I kind of do that as a way to prepare for disasters, sometimes people do that as just kind of a fun game, but they never really go past the what if. 
And it's kind of concerning because some of the um, statistics that I found, the current ones, is that 40%, more than 40% of our households in the U.S. do not have an adequate supply of water that would last them three days. And we know, as a health professional I know, and I'm sure you all know, within 24 hours, we're without water, we're in some dehydration state. And depending on the weather and um, the exertion that we're having to go through, it could be sooner than that. And then things can get pretty critical at 48 hours. So not having clean and safe water to sustain life is a problem. Also, one third of our US households do not have enough food in their home to even last three days. And I had to check that statistic a couple places because I thought, really? <laughs> I, that to me was kind of surprising that they wouldn't even have enough in their homes or where they dwell for three days. So concerning um, and something to really kind of think about as we go along in this presentation, you may have more than three days, but what about those around you? And then households that experience food insecurity may have less than a day's total worth of food. Now food insecurity, what that means is that these are individuals that struggle to keep enough food in their home on a regular basis and they will miss meals um, daily, weekly, or monthly, depending on the state of their food insecurity. So it means they don't know how to, they can't physically, either because they don't have enough money or they don't have access to grocery stores or places to buy food, they can't get enough food to last them, um, even for a day, let alone a disaster situation, okay? And they're at more risk. So we may, they may be out of food within one meal. And this came into really sharp focus for me last year as this pandemic came into play. I remember it was about, you know, just a little earlier than this in the year, so mid-March. Um, I remember the news talking about the pandemic and what was going to happen and how things were going down and we we're talking about a shutdown and I thought, there's no way they're gonna shut things down, you know, my optimistic, not really wanting to deal with it self. But uh, it was Thursday morning before they announced that schools were gonna be closed and all business, all non-essential businesses were going to be closed. And I just thought, well, I'm gonna to go to the grocery store and get a few things. And when I got to the grocery store, there was a few people in there buying, some had some big carts, but the shelves were full, didn't seem to be a big deal. Well, that evening they announced that the schools were shutting down and non-essential businesses were closing. And so I thought, well, now we better get in and see what we can get to last us through in case there's not food deliveries. And when I went into the grocery store, and this wasn't even, it might've been 24 hours, not quite. It looked like this. And this isn't in the grocery store shelves in my local grocery, but it was scary to me. I've never seen shelves this depleted that quickly. So in my area, it wasn't even 24 hours and there was pretty much no food left on the shelf, just specialty items and things that people don't generally choose. Um, and as you all know, and probably saw this stayed this way for at least three months before we saw shelves be pretty full. And there's still um, times I go to the grocery store and things are out and there's just none. I remember it took what, almost nine months for ramen to be on the shelves again. So I don't know if that was your experience, but the things that were not coming into the stores and that were not on the shelves was interesting to watch and to see. And we were lucky because the truck lines were still open and we could still get shipments, may not get everything, but we could get something. Uh, so, you know, thinking about our experiences this last year should hopefully help inspire us to do better and to realize that quickly food is depleted. And if we don't have food and the water, of course, was long gone by the time I got there Friday morning, um, we may be in some big trouble. And um, hopefully this is the kind of thing that people are thinking about and that we're thinking about that we need to put the effort in no matter how difficult it may seem to get the food taken care of and the essentials ready. I also found this was really concerning to me because we're not always talking about a global pandemic when we're talking about you know, emergency preparedness. Sometimes it is a natural disaster or a storm that is going to shut our area down for two, three days a week. And that could be really critical for people that don't even have a day's worth of food or clean water. Um, this is an accounting of just the natural, natural disasters and weather related um, storms 
or disasters that cost a billion dollars or more in the US. And typically these would mean that large areas were shut down for three to four days without, at least without you know, shipments of water or food or emergency help. There were 22 in just 2020 alone. And this kind of sobered me a little bit because I thought, really, we had that many? And, you know, I didn't hear about all of them because, you know, we only hear some of the news, not all of the news, but look at this, 22 separate billion dollar weather and climate disasters. And that's not earthquakes or um, other things like that. This is just weather related ones that could and did definitely reduce services for areas. So helping, I hope you'll understand from this presentation that it isn't just pandemics or massive earthquakes or, you know, tsunamis that we're worried about. We're worried about storms that could happen and put us out of commission for a day or two and not be able to get people essentials. So what do we do? What do we do if you are limited in space and, and can't really seem to find a way forward? Um, the first thing is to condense. When you live in a small space or you only have so much space allotted to you, you need to find places to put essential items. And that may mean that you need to condense, go through things, get rid of it, donate it, um, get a storage shed in another area if you need to, to store you know, things you just can't part with. Um, also find better ways to store so that you can free up space for emergency supplies that should be in your immediate dwelling with you. Now it's something to think about, you know, getting an outside storage shed to put storage items in, but in a disaster, would you be able to access that? And could you get there to get those essential supplies? So really those essential supplies need to be where you live so that you have ready and easy access to them in case of a disaster or problem, emergency of some sort, all right? Um, walk through some scenarios with your family and as you're condensing and cleaning and finding drawers and covers and shelves to put emergency supplies on, walk through, if you had to get out fast, where would be the best central place to put the, the supplies that you would need? If you had to hunker down and you know stay away from windows and you couldn't go near um, heating vents or things like that for whatever reason, where would you dwell? And how would you have the stuff close to you so that you could get to it in case of those kind of disasters? So once you condense and find the room and look for um, the things that you need, then let's start a plan. So whoever lives in your um, apartment with you or your dwelling with you, all of them together. So with my kids, I would encourage them, you know, get your roommates together, talk to them, see what they have you know, no plan. If there's a fire, where are we going? If there's an earthquake and this happens, how will it happen? Or if we get quarantined, what are we gonna do? And that actually kind of happened to my kids in the fall, um, whole apartments would get quarantined and they would come and put like this big strip of tape on their door and they weren't allowed to open the door because if the tape was broken, then the university, I don't remember exactly what they would do, but there was some kind of monitoring of that seal. And then they would bring them meals and get it to them somehow. Um, so it kind of interesting. And so I was like, what are you gonna do? You know, if they quarantine you and now you're stuck for two weeks in your apartment, do you have enough food? Do you have enough toiletries? What could you do? So those kind of plans are essential. And then also with that plan was where we're gonna start first, how we're gonna start, what we're gonna do. And then always with this, and I think this is where a lot of people get stuck, is we need a way to keep it going. You know, we're really great at doing that front work, finding out, starting things, and then life gets us and it gets hard to sustain. So having a plan to sustain a regular time to come together and say, once a month, this day, like up for us, Sunday afternoons is a really good time. On the first Sunday of the month, come together, talk about our plan, talk about where we're going with food storage, water storage, you know, all of those things and emergency preparedness, things that could be happening are in the air. Really great idea to just schedule that and make it a constant consistent theme. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about water. Water is the most essential nutrient uh, because we rely on it so much. And without water, you can't live, you can't think, you can't function. So water has to be, um, 
the first thing that we talk about. Um, some may disagree with me on that, but I've treated a lot of people in hospitals that simply dehydrated and they really cannot function or do anything well without water. So super important that we um, do our part to uh, get the water that we need and it needs to be clean and safe water. Getting a disease like um, dysentery or something from unclean water or something even worse will just tend to, it will just make us more dehydrated and more susceptible to um, worse diseases and even death. So thinking about this, do you have enough water in your residence for 72 hours? And in a small space, that may be all you could do is 72 hours. That would be a bare minimum of water, would be one gallon of water per person per day. So if you have six people in your apartment, you need to have six gallons times out by three, right? So where are you going to store 18 gallons of water? And that's just bare minimum, right? So finding ways to do that and to make it um, just automatic. We know where that water is, we have it, we're ready. The ideal thing would be to have a month because in some cases, um, and I was trying to find the exact statistics, but I know it was over a week that residents in Texas that had the recent ice storm and the water mains burst and they weren't able to get clean water. And of course the stores are depleted quickly. Um, it was at least a week before they could get regular services. And then a lot of them got them on a truck that was brought into them, right? So having enough for a month would just give you that extra added security. And then let's talk about what are we gonna do when it's longer than a month and how are we going to do that? Now, logistically, it may be really difficult in an apartment, um, but we can think along these kinds of lines, especially when we're storing water. Not every water is okay to just store, right? When I was growing up, my mom used to always make us empty out the two liter bottles that we had soda pop in and we'd clean them out really good with soap and then mom would fill them with water and we would put them in the basement. We had so many two liter bottles full of water. Um, not the best way to store water, right? We didn't know that. So figure out how to store water and what's the best way to store water so that it can be safe and um, beneficial instead of more harming, okay? So one way you can do that is to buy commercially packaged waters. They're good, they have expiration dates, obey the expiration dates and be aware of rotation for that water. Know how to clean storage containers. Um, soap and water, and then a bleach solution. And the bleach solution will depend on how much you need um, and how much you're storing. It's generally one teaspoon of bleach per quart of water, and then use culinary water to fill those buckets, okay? And then if you have filled them yourself, you should be emptying those and refilling them every six months. That's the best recommendation that I could find. Um, and then how you store that, what kind of container, what will it look like? We're gonna look at that in just a second. Think about your storage containers that they are food grade. A lot of people don't know that there's a difference between food grade and commercial grade or um, other grades, right? So know if it's food grade. One thing that I think is really great is most of the um, water containers that I purchase are blue. They're that dark blue or a blue color. And then they have the symbol on them that tells you they're food grade. So look for that. Um, make sure they have tight fitting lids because water is damaging, right? If it gets, if it leaks and we don't want anything to get into it that could contaminate it. So tight fitting lids, um, think about filling tubs and sinks or make that part of your emergency plan. If you think that you might be um, heading into a disaster, there was an earthquake, you're not sure if the water supply is going to be contaminated, turn off your water supply to the city, turn it off at your house, fill up your sinks and waters and tubs first, then turn it off and, and then, be able to leach your lines when you need it, if you need it, um, your water lines. So think about that, because you can fill up tubs and sinks and that use that water first before it becomes contaminated. Um, and then try to find some creative places to find and store water. Think about water heater tanks. Um, many houses have started installing two water heater tanks for smaller homes, three or four for larger ones. For a couple of reasons, we like our hot water, but also because there is a ready storage right there of water. In my house, I have hundred gallons in water heaters. Um, think about where you could put water. 
if you have a little garage space, if you have um, other places, we're going to, I'll show you some pictures of that in just a minute, but understand and recognize that you have limited space in these small spaces. So investing in a water purifier is actually a really smart idea. They take up less room. And if you can find a water source, you can generally make any water source safe. Um, so having a water fear, a water purification purifier, not the ones that we then put on the sink or that's coming through our fridge, but a um, water purifier that is slated to clean water that is not, has not been culinary, okay? They're a little bit different. So do your research and look for a water purifier. Um, so some storage containers that I've seen and I think are actually pretty brilliant as these water bricks, um, they can be stacked and they can, um, be made into any configuration. Like you can see this, this was made for some kids to play um, a castle in, <laughs> and they're very sturdy. They lock together. Um, they have really tight lids, so they can't let you know anything in. They hold about three and a half gallons of water per brick. So you can see you can get quite a bit of water um, in these bricks. And I saw another picture where people had made a coffee table out of these. They you know, stacked the bricks and then put like a clear glass top on it. Um, so this is a really great way to be creative and to have your water storage. These would fit under desks, um, other places, okay, that you can think of on top of washer and dryers, on top of cabinets. Another great idea too is these water dispensers. Um, they could be a little pricey, but once you have them, they dispense without electricity. So it's a great way to keep your water safe and free from contaminants. Plus, they're five gallon tanks, right? And if you had three of them that you just stored away under like a cupboard or a table or something, three to four of them, um, you got 20 gallons of water, okay, that you could use. So this just might be a good habit because then you're, you know, changing them out regularly, using them in your home to drink water, and then you have safe water at least for three days. Um, the water bob is another really cool thing. You see down here on the left, it's, um, like a bladder, a plastic bladder that you can put in your tub and you just fill it up with tub water and cap it and it can hold sanitary for days. Okay. And there's a lot of gallons of water in those tubs. So they're not reusable, but hey, they'd be worth having on hand so that you can have it ready. You could also make under the bed, right? This would be a great place to put some water and keep it stored under that mattress. There's always enough room under those beds. We can clean them out and get all the stuff out from underneath them. My kids' beds, maybe not, but other beds in the house um, might be a great place. On the left is pictured some um, water filtra filtration systems that you could have on hand. They don't take a lot of space. They can filter a good portion of water for quite a while. So I would know the gallons that they can uh, filter how much they can filter within a certain amount of time and then know how many you would need for the people in your house. Okay. Some of them, there's some larger ones that you can get that will do gallons at a time, but it would just depend on your needs, uh, which filtration system you would want to use. I have life straws um, in my house and in our 72 hour kits because they're pretty simple um, use, but they don't give you as long a life as some of these other uh, filtration systems. So if you live in an area where people get you know, shut down from their utilities more often, you may need something that uh, will last longer. On the right, you'll see some containers that are used for storing water, all different kinds. One thing I would um, caution you on is the ability to move the water, okay? We want to be careful not to get too big of barrels or things in small spaces that you're not able to move so that you can drain them and you can transport them if you have to leave. Okay, and then the good old plastic water bottles. Um, these are always great to have on hand because they're fast. You can throw them in a car, you can throw them in backpacks if you have to bug out fast. Um, and you know, they're sanitary and you can you know, use them, rotate them through. And plastic bottles aren't great for the environment, but for um, three day supply might be a really great thing to have in your home. Okay, the second essential is food super necessary, right? Um, we can go quite a few days without food, but we start to lose like our reasoning and our cognitive value after about 24 to 36 hours of no food or no calories. 
Um, and from there, it just kind of degrades. We start to make bad choices and um, things can just get bad for us <laughs> when we're without food. So it's necessary to have food um, and to have enough calories to sustain um, critical processes in the body. So again, do we have enough for three days for our 72 hour cycle? Do we have enough to go from pay cycle to pay cycle? Okay, so that would generally be two weeks for a lot of people, could be monthly, right? I like to think of it that way because, you know, if when you get paid is generally when we have the money to stock up or do extra. So could we go from pay cycle to pay, pay cycle and then a more long-term solution for food? couple tips that I have for this, and this is after years of storing food and throwing some away um, and then realizing, why did I store that? We never eat that. Um, store what you eat, eat what you store. I've seen way too many people throwing massive amounts of money away because the food spoils. They had the food storage, they were all great, but it spoiled, right? And they didn't eat it. So food is not gonna last forever. I remember during the Y2K shortage or when it was changing to the year 2000, there was this big um, kind of hysteria that all the computers were going to crash. And so people were stocking and prepping. Um, and that kind of dates me, I don't know how old I am when I talk about Y2K. Um, but I remember people were kind of hysterically buying up and buying strange things that they just never eat. And I had some family members that did that as well. And, you know, Five years after Y2K, they're throwing a lot of stuff out because they bought too much, they didn't rotate it, they didn't use it, and now it's just a waste, okay? So store what you eat because then you're never wasting it. You're using it and then have a system to rotate. So you bring new in, it goes to the back, however you do it, have a system so that you're never having to waste food or throw it away. And that's not the point of this. The point isn't to waste resources, it's to use resources and have them ready when we need them. All right, no shelf life. Um, I get a lot of people asking me about this. <laughs> I've just a lot of questions on shelf life. And when should I throw the food away? And when is it not good anymore? Well, as you all know, there are dates on foods and some foods will have a best buy date and some foods will have a sell by date. Those are different dates. Um, one is what the store is willing to hold that food to a certain point. Still good, the manufacturer guarantees it's good, but they won't sell it anymore. Okay, and then it goes to the use by date, which is the second date or the later date. Um, that's when the manufacturers are no longer guaranteeing that that food will be safe or nutritive. Uh, so know the dates, okay? Know where they're at, know how to find them. Um, and then use that to rotate your system and to know how much you can store, right? That's another thing. Can you eat that much food of that kind in enough time before you have to throw it away? Okay. And again, stockpiling doesn't do you a whole good, a whole lot of good if you're just going to have to throw it away because you didn't use it. All right. So some foods, um, and I would say that for frozen and refrigerated foods as well. I have people say to me, oh, if it's in the freezer, it lasts forever. Not so, okay, not so. Know the dates and know those shelf lives. Uh, because especially in a small area, you need to maximize your space, right? So you want to make sure that you're using what you're storing because then it makes more sense to have food storage in your area, in your home, in your dwelling, okay? Also, don't rely on freezers and refrigerators. Um, the USDA states that your refrigerator can keep food good and unspoiled for about four hours in a power outage. Now that may seem a little short and it is a little short in my mind too, but I'm giving you the USDA's recommendation. Another thing you can do is to have a thermometer on hand and I can even use those STEM kitchen thermometers that you see. Um, you can stick that in your fridge as soon as the power goes out kind of closer to the door and then just monitor that temperature, right? If it's staying, right around 32 to 38 degrees, then the food is good. Once it gets up into the 40 degree range, okay, then we need to start counting. And from that point, within four hours, you need to throw all that food away if you haven't restored power to that refrigerator. So even though it seems like a great place to put food to store it, um, it may not be your best option if the power's out for days. 
right? With frozen foods, um, you need to think about if how long it's been in the freezer without power. Generally, you can go 24 to 48 hours, depending on how full your freezer is, um, but watch the food. If there's still ice crystals in it, then it's safe to eat, to cook and eat, but soon, okay? So think about dry food stuffs as well um, when you're thinking about storage, okay? Um, look for foods that are on sale and purchase extra when you go grocery shopping. It really doesn't take you a lot more money to add four or five more cans or boxes to your grocery list and then store that extra, all right? And if you do that over time, pretty soon, you're going to have a nice setup for your food storage. And then consider freeze-dried foods. Um, they take less space. They can sit in a cupboard, a dark cupboard for a lot longer than some of our shelf stable foods. And in a small place, that might be your best bet for foods. You might try to keep at least, you know, a month in your home. If that, you know, if you can fit it there and you should be able to keep about a month. And then from there, you would have to use freeze dried foods, um, which isn't a bad thing. It just may be the nature of where you're living at the time. But just recognize that with freeze-dried food, it takes water to reconstitute those foods. And even when you eat them, you need to have more, if you even eat them as a fro froze freeze-dried, not reconstituted, you need more water in your body to um, compensate for that. All right, so that's something to think about if you're going to use freeze-dried foods is that you may need more water, okay? Okay, so some creative ways to store. Um, like we said, start storing by extra at the grocery store. Learn how to preserve food. And yes, you can preserve food in a small kitchen, in an apartment, okay? There's ways to do it. Um, container garden. So you can find any spot that your landlord will let you or the property owner will let you or, you know, decks, roofs, things of those kind of things. You can container garden that's actually sustainable through disaster, right? So if you have a growing season and you can be in it, you can grow some food and you can preserve that food, right? So it gives you more say in what you're eating. And then look for creative storage space. So under the bed, right? We got lots of under the beds, under couches. Um, there's great like slide in and out shelf that goes right next to your refrigerator. Usually there's about this much of a gap, right? So you can pull that in and out. It's a great place to store things. Um, under decorative tables, um, over the door hangers on pantries or bathrooms or anywhere. You can get the ones like this that are like an actual, you can screw them into the door, or you can get ones that just hang over the door if you're not able to alter the um, walls and doors where you live. Um, remember to stack, think about stacking. You know, you, you have ways to go up. So if you have things in safe containers that stack and stay stable, that's a great way to store foods, especially in small spaces. And I thought this um, idea right here in the middle with the file folder caddy, that it fits canned foods great. So that might be a way to be able to maximize your space in a pantry or a countertop, especially for like college students. I thought that would be great for my kids because most of them only have like, I think my son only has two shelves and two cupboards in his apartment. And so I thought we could do that. We could totally like have cases of chili and stuff in his cupboards, easily accessible and stack them in these kind of file folders. So five file folder cases. So it's something to think about. Okay, so then we're gonna talk really quick. Um, we have just a few, about 10 minutes to finish up. Uh, so I thought we would talk about basic food storage list, how you get that started um, and what should be included on it. People are always asking me that. Well. If I have to store something, what's the most important thing to store? Well, I'm going to tell you a balanced diet, right? And they're like, how do you do that? Well, we need to focus on a few things, um, but we need to try to avoid the mistake of what I see a lot of times. And I even saw this during the pandemic. Uh, people panicked and they started buying like bags of flour and rice and oatmeal which is great, we need that, right? Those are calories, they keep us alive. But if we're not focusing on the vitamins and minerals as well, then we're going to have problems down the line because our vitamins and minerals are just as important as calories. And we don't get enough from those refined flours and grains uh, to maintain life and the processes of the body. So 
we need proteins and fats. And I'm sorry, that fats should have been on a different line. <laughs> so think about proteins and fats, um, freeze dried meats, canned meats, um, canned and dried beans. Those all work into proteins, fats. Okay. And remember fats are hard to store. They have to be used regularly because they can go rancid. Um, but how can you store fats? What kind of fats are more sustainable? Uh, what do you use, right? Uh, canned soups, vegetables, fruits, cereals and starches tend to be what people go for first. They tend to go and grab that stuff and, oh, I'm good. Um, but think about where we're going to get vitamins and minerals, right? We got to have them from fruits and vegetables as well. Sorry about the sirens. You can hear those. Um, dinner mixes. So those would be box mixes like hamburger helpers or tuna helpers. And um, if you use those often, those are great to keep in storage and to have ready to use. Uh, baking supplies. That was another thing that went really fast during the pandemic. Uh, yeast, baking powder, baking soda, because flour just really by itself without a leavening isn't that great, right? Until you have time to make like a sourdough start or something. Um, so think about that as well. And again, those go bad, right? So you got to be able to rotate those so baking sodas and powders and things. They lose their active um, elements over time. Then I'm going to put a plug in for canned and dried beans. However, I tell people all the time, you should store canned and dried beans. Uh, beans are an amazing plant food that has the ability to give us vitamins and minerals and protein and fats and carbohydrates. They're pretty amazing. Uh, we don't eat them enough in our society. And that's a problem because a lot of people don't know how to cook them either. Uh, so that's another thing that I always recommend is that you know how to cook what you store. It does you no good if you don't know how to use it. You know, and dry beans, they don't take up a lot of room. So they'd be great to store in small spaces, but you got to be able to use them, right? And use them on a regular basis. So this is a basic food storage list. So how do I get started? This seems super overwhelming to people. They're like, oh, I got to get proteins and fats and that. So this is where I have you start. Um, so we're gonna take just a minute and go through this really fast. Um, so get your piece of paper out and your pen and draw a grid kind of like this. So you're gonna have three columns, three rows, and then you're gonna, you're going to, sorry, <laughs> that was a great grammar. You're going to label the first one breakfast, the second one lunch, and the third one dinner. And this may seem really simple to people, uh, but it helps us get that um, balanced eating and thinking about all of our meals through the day, okay? Now in the first box, I'm just gonna give you like one minute to write, let's go to the dinner box first, okay? This is generally the hardest one because most of us eat the same thing for breakfast. We usually have, we're habits, we're creatures of habit, right? And we like the same thing for breakfast. So we'll get to that in a minute. It's going to be easier. And lunch is sometimes easier too. Dinners are always the ones like we need something different, more substantial, if that's how you run. Okay, that's the bigger meal of the day. So I'm just gonna give you one minute and I want you to write down as many meals as you can think of that you know how to prepare that you like to eat um, that you can, you know, shop for. Now you can't put in things like McDonald's or taco time, right? Because we're thinking disaster situation here. Those aren't going to be available. So things that you like to eat and could prepare. Okay. All right. So you got one minute. Go. Okay. Hopefully you got a few they about done. It's kind of hard to do this over on a webinar because I can't see who's still working. So hopefully you got a good list down of dinners and you were able to fire some off. If you're like, my kids are always like, what is that stuff we eat? What do we call it? So hopefully you had some good ideas. Okay. Now I want you to look at your list. Um, and I'm going to show you my example, but mine has like lunches and breakfast on already. We're just going to go with, um, oops, hang on, my slide doesn't want to advance. Okay. So let's just look at the dinner one for now. So I wrote down all these different things, okay? Now I want you to just circle seven of those, okay? Or we can even start with two or three, okay? This is a little overwhelming for you. So just, you know, pick a couple of the mills and circle them. And then you're gonna go down in the second box 
and write down what you would need to make that meal, right? So you, for spaghetti, you would need spaghetti noodles, spaghetti sauce and hamburger. That's what my family puts in there. So marinara sauce and hamburger. Um, canned chicken for the chicken salad, almonds, mayonnaise, frozen dough or flour to make dough, right? Now, those are the kinds of things I would need. Those are the ingredients, some of the ingredients I would need to make those meals. And if I was going to go to the grocery store and buy that, I would buy one of all those probably, right? So in this sense, what you're going to do is you're going to buy double everything that you need, but twice, and then put it in the storage. And if you do this, you have seven that you start with this week. And if you can't afford to do all of that in one week, you just pick a couple meals to do that with and get those in your pantries or in your cupboards, okay? And then build out from there. But if you were able to do seven dinners a week, then you have a month's worth of dinners in your cupboard, right? One thing I do want you to note though, notice that I just put spaghetti, chicken salad in there and the ingredients for those, but I'm kind of missing some key food groups, right? If all I eat is spaghetti, spaghetti sauce and hamburger for dinner, I'm missing some things, right? I'm missing some of the micronutrients that I need or the vitamins and minerals that I need. So I need to add in vegetables or fruits, right? To my list so that I have some of those on hand as well. So spaghetti goes really good with green beans. So let's add four cans of green beans to that list so that we're getting a more balanced meal, right? Same thing with the chicken salad. We can add um, some celery to that, water chestnuts. We can get some um, grapes to put in it, right? Now, not all of those things are shelf stable. So then I would challenge you to look at, okay, where we're at and what could I substitute this shelf stable? So if I like grapes in my chicken salad, I could substitute craisins, right? It's a good substitute. They hold on a shelf. I can use them often and have them for that vitamin C that I need, okay? And then you can do this same exercise with lunch and breakfast and those kind of things until you get that month's storage. Now, this may take you six months to buy the extra that you need, but once you have it in place, then every time you take out of your pantry, you write that down on a list so that you can put it back. And then you also always know that you have a month's worth of food to feed you and your family. Okay. May seem simple, but it really works. This is how I've been doing it. It's how my mom did it. My mom used to have like an inventory list in her food store. She had a lot of room and was able to have a big storage room. And so we would just write down what we took out and then she would be able to watch for sales and purchase it again. So we always had what we needed. But this is also a really great system. You just shop from your pantry, you write down what you're taking out, then when you go grocery shopping, you put it back and it's always there, it's always ready. So hopefully this helped you a little bit to kind of think about where to start and how to get going. Because remember, start somewhere, right? So even if all you got down was two meals, and you go to the grocery store this weekend, we're just gonna buy double, now you got it, right? Next week, we'll do the same thing, okay? Um, and also really helpful in Utah, we often have case lot sales. So if you watch for those, a lot of times you're going to be getting um, better deals on these foodstuffs and being able to save a little money that way. Um, but this is also a great way to do it. All right, so quickly, um, I can't remember exactly when I'm supposed to be done. So if I start going over, I thought it was um, 10 to, so. Um, I'll just run through these really quick and then we'll have some time for questions. Uh, but if you need me to stop, just interrupt me and I can stop. Um, so some other essentials are bug out bags or 72 hour kits. Uh, April, I just yes, want to let you know that there is a cutoff at 10 2. So okay. feel free to just wrap up and we'll be done. Okay. Okay. I'll just show you really quick. These um, few slides that I thought about, they're just kind of the extra stuff. Um, thinking about hygiene and how you would manage waste um, and having those kind of supplies ready, first aid and medicine, and then how we would compensate with children. 
Um, I just tell you a little bit about extension. We're online, we're all over, we're in every county in Utah. And I would love your thoughts um, if you would be willing to uh, take my survey and give me some thoughts on your um, this presentation and what you learned from it. I would really appreciate that and maybe being able to provide more of this information for others and you in the future. So I put the link in the chat or you can scan this QR code. Thank you so much. I hope this was informative. Okay, thank you, April. We had just a few questions and they were answered in the chat. So I sure appreciate that. And I'm going to turn the time back to Wade. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Cindy. Thank you very much, April, for that excellent presentation. Such good information there uh, as well. So um, I don't know if, if there was anybody, I think we do have a time for a question or two. If there were any questions that were not answered or um, we wanted to reiterate here, we could, uh, we could do that at this point. But we do have Brian that's gonna be pulling up a quick uh, um, uh, promotional video for us from Utah State University Extension. So Brian, why don't you go ahead and and pull that up for us as well. But uh, let's see. So just Ter Teresa is presenting. Pardon me. Teresa was presenting this 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 go round. Okay. So we'll have Teresa pulling that up. So April, yeah, just a couple of questions you might uh, maybe add a little bit to. We've we've answered online a little bit already. But as far as storing storing uh, uh, water uh, in garages or on concrete floors, what's your recommendation about that? Um. Yeah, that's a hard one. I store water in a garage because that's one, I've had water leak in my house. <laughs> and so I try to avoid that because the damage is pretty um, extensive. If you have a cement floor in a basement, that's a better place because it's colder and darker and the water can be um, more, like it tastes better. I don't think it's unsafe, but it just tastes better when it hasn't been heated up and cooled down. Um, but I do store it in my garage um, now. That way it's easier for me to just drain them. I have some big barrels out there too though. Um, but what my biggest thing is, is to try to just rotate it. If you have it in a garage, try to use it regularly, then you're not having issues with the heat or the cold. And um, it's just a little bit easier to manage in a garage. So on a cement floor, no, I make sure that it's off the floor, either on pallets or on some kind of a barrel or bucket so that it's not leaching things out of cement. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Yeah, good explanations there. Um, and uh, James, were there any other questions that we didn't get answered that we might need to bring up right now? James or anyone else watching the... Yeah, there was one question on the sheet that just came in. How long, well, unless you answered that one. How long... Uh, how long can we store water? I guess, is that the question? How long for water to be contaminated? If I'm understanding the question correctly. So basically, what's your recommendation as far as uh, long-term water storage? You know, USU Extension Service did a survey that said water could be stored indefinitely if it was treated and in a good container in a good location. But did you have anything else that you would recommend about that? For home storage, that well, that's true. For home storage, I, I um, rotate mine every six months. I drain them. I use them to water flowers or clean things and then refill them up and treat the water again and wash the barrel with soap and um, chlorine just because I like to be safe and make sure my kids are okay. So, and it's not hard. We do it in the fall, like in October before it gets cold and then we do it in the spring and it's, it's a good system for us. So, and then you can watch expiration dates on commercially packaged waters and just use those before the dates expire. Okay, thank you very much, April. Hey, Ken. Hey. How was your weekend? Uh, it was good. I mowed the lawn and watched the game. You? I filled my emergency water storage containers with water. I found out if you're using city tap water, it's already treated and ready for long-term storage. You don't have to add anything to it. Huh. I should do that. <laughs>